Um, and then last Sunday, um, for those of you who stayed to watch the game, uh, all of you know that we went home a little quiet and sad, especially after the overtime, even though we had hot dogs. Um, so today I thought about preaching from one of the Psalms. As you know, we're going through Psalms, right? I thought about preaching about the Psalms of lament or the Psalms of grief or, or asking God to really comfort us in, our, in the 49ers loss. But, but since Lawrence isn't here, because he's away at the youth retreat, um, I'll wait until another time, all right? <laughs> So we're actually going to take a break this week from the book of Psalms. Um, We're going to take a one-week break. Next week, we'll continue in the book of Psalms. But some of you may know that in our San Jose church, uh, we have a daily Bible reading plan that includes passages of Scripture from the Psalms, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and from the Proverbs. And I think we've been doing this for probably, I would say, at least the last 20 years or so, if not more. Um, And then it's interesting because even though you read the same passage once a year, there always seems to be like a new revelation or a stark reminder of what God says through his word. Uh, Sometimes perhaps it's that you've never seen it before or something that maybe you may have missed. and, And that's really the beauty of God's word and how he really speaks to each one of us, um, pointing out new things, perhaps things that we glanced, we kind of quickly went through before, but then maybe that particular year, that particular day, God is opening our eyes, um, or even perhaps reminding us of things that we may have forgotten, or even revealing new truths to us. And and that's exactly what God did to me um, earlier this month as I was reading from the book of Exodus uh, at the beginning of the month. I, I, before I, I talk, I do want to mention that the school actually got new lights. So, so it's really bright, so, but it also affects the screen, okay? So we're still trying to figure out how to you know, manage the screen with, with, with the bright lights, but I'm grateful for the new lights. Um, but, but basically, as I was reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, there was actually something that stood out that I had never seen before or really realized Or maybe if I did, I had um, entirely forgotten about it. Now, this is the account of where the Lord led Moses and the people of Israel out of slavery in the land of Egypt. Uh, You may have remembered that um, they had been slaves in Egypt, the Israelites, for 430 years, right? After the days of Joseph and, and, you know, Potiphar and, you know, the Pharaoh back in that day, The people of Israel multiplied, and they became such a great force that the new Pharaoh put them into slavery. And they were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And you remember that God appeared to Moses in a burning bush because he heard the cries of his people calling out to him, and and he told Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. And of course, you also remember that Pharaoh's heart was very much hardened, and he really refused time and time again. He would say yes, but then he would renege. Uh, he would refuse to let the Israelites leave. And then you remember that God sent 10 plagues. I don't know if you remember all of them, but there was a plague of blood, frogs, gnats, flies, livestock dying, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and then finally the killing of the firstborn son. And only after Pharaoh's firstborn son died did he relent. And he was true to his word, and he finally let the Israelites go. But now that the Israelites had left, Pharaoh, as we'll see in chapter 14 of Exodus, he had a change of heart. And he actually started pursuing the Israelites again, chasing them through the desert. Uh, And the people of Israel were actually camped at the edge of the Red Sea. And this is really where we pick off. Um, I'm going to it's a, I don't know if we'll get through the whole chapter, okay, but we'll, we'll, we'll do as best as we can. Um, but I'm going to read, I'm going to uh, read for you because it's about 30 some verses, uh, verses at least one through, let's see, four. So uh, uh, follow on the screen as I read. And then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and to encamp in front of Fihahiroth between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. This is verse 2. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they're wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. 
and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. All right, we'll start there. All right, so God instructs Moses and the people of Israel to actually turn back from where they were going and to camp right in the spot, right by the Red Sea, where they would really have no route of escape when Pharaoh's army would come after them. Now, it's interesting because, in fact, God wanted Pharaoh to believe that the Israelites were wandering. And actually, God told Moses to lead Israel in the way where it appeared to Pharaoh that they kind of looked confused, right? So that Pharaoh would want to come after them. Now, verse 4 actually repeats what God had said to Moses before and during the time of the plagues. Verse 4 says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so I will harden Pharaoh's heart. We, you may remember that phrase from before. It was actually recorded in Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 7. Um, you know, this was even during the time of the plagues where God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And then he also says, I will get glory over Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 7 recounts where God mentioned that again. And then also Exodus chapter 7 also says that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. This is, again, things that God had said before to Pharaoh. So this is, again, God repeating the same thing. It's almost like as if Pharaoh didn't really learn the lesson from the ten plagues because God's basically telling Moses that he's going to do the same thing to Pharaoh. Now, what's interesting is that this is what I didn't realize. In verse 1, it said, the Lord actually said to Moses. This is actually what God told Moses to do. Like, God had this plan Basically, he said, hey, you know what? Pharaoh's going to come after you. I'm going to harden his heart again. I'm going to get glory over Pharaoh. And then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. As if it was like deja vu, you know, what, what happened in the land of Israel, in the land of Egypt. Now, the Israelites, I'm sure, they may have been confused as to why they were camping by the Red Sea. But you see, God actually knew the reason God actually had a bigger purpose and plan for them. He already knew that Pharaoh would pursue them, and he actually told Moses that. Right? So I think what I, what I, I guess what, it, what was a real revelation to me was that he actually told Moses in verse 1 that this is, in fact, what's going to happen. Like, you know, they're going to come after you again, but I'm going to get the glory. They're going to come after you. They're going to pursue you, but I will get the glory, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God already knew that Pharaoh would pursue the Israelites, but at the end, he would get the glory. He actually told Moses what would happen, that Pharaoh's heart would harden, that he would pursue them, that he would get the glory. Again, it's like a repeat of what happened a few chapters ago, right? except under different circumstances. Now, of course, they're in the desert, and they're facing the Red Sea. What's interesting is God was not specific as to how it all would pan out. He wasn't specific about how they would be freed. He wasn't specific about how the, the Egyptians would be defeated. He wasn't specific about how they would be rescued, how they would be delivered. But he did tell Moses that he would ultimately get the glory. And that even with the Egyptians, the enemies of God, that they would know that he is the Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, when we go through things in our lives, when we go through trials, when we feel like we're facing the Red Sea and perhaps our enemies are coming against us, when we feel like we're basically penned up against the wall, when we feel like there's a dead end, many times we might forget what the Lord has already told us. Just like what the Lord told Moses. He said, you know what? I know this is going to happen but I'm still going to deliver. He doesn't go into specifics about how, but he says, I will get the glory. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So one of the questions that I want to ask you is, just like how the Lord said to Moses, what has the Lord said to you and me? What promise has the Lord spoken to you in the past? 
maybe in the present. It may not be as big as leading the people of Israel across the Red Sea, but it might just be a simple promise or a simple word, a simple phrase that maybe God has said to you in the past. Recall what he has spoken to you and really hold on to that promise. Cling on to it. Maybe for some of us, we may have forgotten what God has said to us in the past. Maybe we need to ask him to remind us of, God, what is it that you spoke to me before? You know, in times of fear or doubt, when you feel like we're at the edge of the Red Sea and your enemies may be chasing after you, when you feel like you're desperate and you don't have a way forward, really allow the Lord to bring to your mind what he has said to you. And to trust that he will be there to deliver you and that he will make a way so that we can walk through the situation. Again, God doesn't reveal to Moses the specifics yet. And that's okay, okay? But God told Moses the promise, right? Which is that he will get the glory and that the Egyptians will know that he is the Lord. He promised deliverance. He wasn't specific about exactly how. But actually, we'll see later that he actually reveals it in due time. You know, for some of us, we may not even know what the Lord may have said to us in the past. Maybe for some of us, we're not really attuned to hearing from the Lord. Maybe for some of us, this whole thing about God speaking to us might be a challenge or a different concept. Um, and, and if that is, that's okay. But I want to invite you to start asking the Lord to speak to you. To start asking the Lord, God, what is it that you have said to me? Or what is it that you are saying to me now, today? Set aside some time to intentionally say, God, would you speak for your servant is listening, just like little Samuel, when he said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Can we come to a place, to a posture where we can quiet ourselves down and say, God, I really want to hear from you. Would you quiet the noises around me? Would you quiet the noise of social media, the noise of my work, the other voices that are going around my head? Would you help me hear from you? Reveal what it is that you are speaking to me for the moment, for my situation. Whatever promise that the Lord may want to speak to you, I want to encourage you to quiet your heart and to ask Jesus to speak and to say, your servant is listening. We're going to move on. Uh, I'm going to read from verses 5 to 9. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this that we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. Verse 8, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the whole, the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pihaharioth and in front of Baal Zephon. Of course, Pharaoh changes his mind. What? What did I just do? I let the slaves go? I let all 600,000 Israelite men go? Why would I do that? He forgot about what his nation had just went through, through the 10 plagues, and he even forgot what happened to his own firstborn son, right? And he pursues, he decides to pursue the Israelites with full force and with a full vengeance. You know, back in those days, the Egyptian chariots, they were the most sophisticated military technology available at that time. And Pharaoh took 600 of these chosen chariots, in addition to all the other chariots that he had in the land. 
They were coming up against not an army, but just a group of Israelite slaves, right? Totally unprepared for battle. But you could, you could kind of, you know, imagine in your mind this vast army charging ahead, right? Trying to figure out where these Israelites were and trying to encamp against them. And of course, in verse 9, it says, they overtook them and they're hemming them in even as the nation of Israel is on the verge of the Red Sea, right? We're going to pick up from verses 10 through uh, 14. I'm going to read this. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians were marching toward them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Verse 12, is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you, only ha- and you have only to be silent. Now, of course, when the Israelites saw the Egyptian army, they were terrified. They were so scared. Right? And of course, in verse 10, as we would do, they cried out to the Lord, right? Fear gripped their hearts, and they, started, they actually started complaining. They actually started thinking like, hey, it would have been better for us to die in Egypt than, than to die out here in the wilderness, right? They're like, that's why Moses, we told you not to lead us out, right? They forgot that they were free. They actually instead wanted to go back to be slaves, right? They had, re, they had gained their freedom, but now they're actually just like saying, no, we want to go back. We want to go back to slavery. We want to like make bricks, you know, for the Egyptians without, without straw again. We want to be beaten by the Egyptians, right? They're basically so afraid that they started complaining. Fear had gripped their hearts. They actually forgot what the Lord had done for them in getting them out of the land of Egypt. They forgot each of the 10 plagues that God sent to deliver them from the land of Egypt. Verse 12, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. The people of Israel were not yet a week out of Egypt, that they're ready, they had this distorted mind of the past, thinking that it was better for them to be back in slavery than to be in freedom. Brothers and sisters, a lot of times, we sometimes are like that. We forget what God has done for us. Right? We forget his blessings. We forget his deliverances. We forget because we're gripped by fear. We forget because we're gripped by despair. We forget because we're di- gripped by, you know, just the lies of the enemy, right? And sometimes we choose to believe the lies than we choose to believe the truth and the promises that God has already stated to us. You know, we need to be reminded of his promises. We need each other to remind ourselves of the promises that God, that God has already spoken to us so that we don't say, hey, I'd rather go back to Egypt and be a slave than to be a free person, right? Now, what's interesting is Moses actually tells the people in verse 13, he says, what does he say? Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. Now, again, what's interesting is, I don't think at that point, God had told Moses all the specifics yet. I don't think God had told Moses of, you know, how he's going to deliver his people. But somehow, Moses told the people, hey, fear not. He responds with great courage against all the thousands of men and women and children that are basically saying, I am so afraid, let's go back to Egypt, right? But he says, fear not. At this point, he doesn't know how God's going to help them in that situation. All Moses knew 
was that God would help. Again, he didn't know the specifics, but he knew that God was true to his promises. He knew that he would deliver. He could speak with this confidence. You know why? Because he knew God's character. He knew who God was. He knew the God of his deliverance. He knew that God wouldn't allow them to die. He knew that God would save them. He knew why? Through experience. He remembered those 10 plagues that God sent to deliver the people of Israel. He knew because he had a relationship with God. He was confident because he knew who God was and continues to be. And because of that, he was able to tell the people of Israel, fear not. When we know God's character, when we know who God really is, we can face our fears. When we know that God is true to his promises, that God is sovereign, that he allows difficulties, challenges, obstacles to happen in our lives, that it's for a greater purpose, that it's for a greater reason. Maybe perhaps it's so that God can be glorified. that we can actually say, fear not to ourselves, to each other. We can actually say that to our circumstances, that I'm not going to be afraid. You know, this is just a fear tactic. You know, even, even for, for Kids Club, there was a, a parent who um, called the school expressing concern. Fear not. We're not afraid. God is on our side. He's going to fight the battle for us. Moses tells the people, fear not, stand firm, right? He basically tells the people, hey, stand firm, stay where you are, stop, right? This is often the Lord's direction to the believer in a time of crisis. Stand firm, you know, despair, fear, that will keep us from standing firm, okay? But basically, God tells Israel, And he often tells us simply to really, hey, chill out. Just stand firm. Just stop. Stop complaining. Stop the whining. Stop being afraid. Just stand firm. And hold on until the Lord reveals his plan. Hold on until God shows us the next step. Moses also tells the people to see the salvation of the Lord. You know, again, Moses doesn't know what, God's going to do. He doesn't know how the salvation is going to come. But again, he knows what the result will be. He knows that God would save his people and that the enemies of the Lord would be destroyed because that's what God said. That's what God told him, right? That the Egyptians will be gone. That they will know that he is the Lord. And I think that's why he could say with confidence in verse 14, The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. All right, we're going to continue. Um, Verse 15 to verse 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, this is where God basically starts unraveling his plan to Moses, right? But before that, verse 15, he basically says, he's asking Moses, why do you, why you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, right? Basically, almost like God's instructions to Moses, hey, stop crying out and start doing. Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Kind of like, hey, stop crying, stop. Now, I say this not heretically, okay? Bear with me. Stop praying and start doing, okay? You know, there's, what I mean is, 
you know, I just said prayer, prayer first. We believe in prayer, okay? But there's a time to pray, but there's also a time to act, okay? Like you could, yes, we know in the power of prayer, right? But sometimes under certain circumstances, it actually might be against God's will to stop doing and to only pray in a particular situation, okay? Now for Moses, this was a time for action and Moses could pray along the way. But basically, God was saying, hey, you need to tell the people of Israel to go forward, okay? When I open that Red Sea, you need to move, okay? Do not just pray and just stay there. You got to go into action. You got to move, okay? And, and, and I guess I, I, I was thinking about, because actually this verse actually kind of convicted me a lot. Um, and some of, well, Cheryl's laughing because I think she probably, she may not know what I'm going to share about. But, but I know some of you know that I have been working on my ordination requirements for many, many, many years. And so I'm down to three papers. And I always tell people, you know, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And I really mean it, like pray for me. But you know what? You guys can pray all you want. Exactly, right? I got to do it, Right? So if I, and so this is what I mean, like, this is not meant to be heresy, okay? But, but I, I use this as an example because I felt like the Lord really convicted me with this. Okay, stop praying, just do it, right? Like, move forward, right? Stop praying, start writing, right? So, so that's what I mean by this example. Sometimes you just say, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. That's great. But you also got to do, and I'm talking to myself here too, okay? You also got to, I got to write, right? And so this is what I mean when God's instructions to Moses is like, you know what? Stop praying, start doing, start moving forward. And yeah, you can still pray, but you got to move, right? Don't just, oh God, you know, deliver us from the Egyptians. When God has opened the Red Sea and you're just like still standing on the shore, not willing to walk forward, right? That's what I mean by stop praying and start doing. So God begins to reveal to Moses his plan of deliverance for the Israelites. Now, verse 16, he basically tells Moses, lift up your staff, I don't have a staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, right? God begins to tell Moses, this is what's going to happen. You're going to take your staff, you're going to lift it up, and you're going to like divide the the Red Sea. The seas are going to open up, right? Now, it sounds such a simple instruction, right? Like, Lift up your staff, uh, stretch out your hand, right? But it's interesting because this simple instruction of lifting up his staff, stretching out his you know, hand, that actually led to a mighty miracle, right? Imagine if Moses didn't do that, the Red Sea wouldn't have parted. I mean, that's what God told Moses to do, a simple task. Lift up the staff in your hand and stretch out your hand. And then boom, the, the oceans part, Right? But this is the thing. Sometimes God just asks us to do a simple thing. And then a miracle happens. Okay, again, it's not our job to figure out how the miracle happens, but it's our job to obey God when he asks us to do the simple thing, to lift up our staff or to stretch out your hand. Right? The simple steps, the step one, step two, those are the things that lead to a miracle. Okay, it's a step of obedience. Again, imagine, what if Moses is like, no, I'm not going to lift up my staff. I'm going to lift up my shoe. I'm going to lift up my sandal, right? God's like, no, that's not what I told you to do. I told you to lift up your staff and stretch out your hand, right? And that's what Moses did. And when he does that, when he did that, we know what happens. The waters begin to part, right? Dry land begins to form, right? And so, you know, don't despise the little things that God may be telling you to do. You know, you might be like, oh God, surely you want me to do something more. No, if God says, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand, you do exactly what he tells you to do, okay? Simple steps. And it's so simple acts of obedience that will oftentimes lead to a bigger miracle. Now, right, okay, and then, you know, he says that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground, right? And then again, he talks, he reminds Moses, I'm going to get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory. So there's this thing about God's glory, right? So, so again, 
You know, when we go through things, when we go through difficulties, when we go through challenges, a lot of times we just think about me, 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 and poor me, or at least I do. Poor me, poor me, you know. But it's not about me, okay? Maybe God wants to put me through that because he wants to get the glory, right? Maybe God wants to put you and I through difficult circumstances, not because of us, but because maybe he wants to get the glory. It's really about him and how he wants to perhaps use us through him getting the glory, through our obedience, through our steps of faith, through our stretching, raising the staff and stretching out our hand. Okay, um, I said this was going to be short. I'm going to, okay. There's just so much in here, okay? Okay, but, but no, 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 because we, we want to do other stuff too. All right, so, so I think I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but basically I think most of us know what happens. I'm just going to paraphrase, all right? So basically, all right, so Moses lifts up his staff, um, his you know, staff stretches out his hand, and then, and then it says, you can read this on your own, Exodus chapter 14, or you, Kevin, you can scroll on the screen. But basically there's a part where, the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, this is in verse 19, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. There was a cloud and darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. So all through the night, this cloud okay, was in between the Israelites and the Egyptians, okay? So as the Egyptians were pursuing the Israelites, God physically moved the clouds and his, his host was there to basically separate the Israelites from the Egyptians. Pillar of cloud and darkness separated the Israelites from the, from the pursuing Egyptians. The waters parted. Israel walked on dry land there was a water on both sides, okay? You, you probably remember the scene, right, from the Ten Commandments, you know, Charlton Heston, and, you know, that's very, very vivid, right? Um, for some of you who remember that. Sorry, Roshan, do you know Ten Commandments? Oh, through your mom. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Wasn't sure if you were, yeah, around yet, but you probably weren't. Um, but basically, okay, also, it talks about, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read this, but when the Egyptians pursued them, okay, God actually threw the Egyptians into a panic, right? Their chariot wheel, get, they got clogged, and they even knew that the Lord was fighting against them, okay? And, and then again, we know that, you know, once all the Israelites went onto the other side, he tells Moses to stretch out his hand over the sea again, and then the water is what? They come crashing down on all of the Egyptians, Right? And of course, they all died. They all perished. Not one of them survived. Not one of them remained in verse 28. Verse 29, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall on them on their right hand and on their left. Right? Then, thus the Lord, this is verse 30, the last, the last two verses. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. It's all about faith. They believed in the Lord, right? All of this was meant to build up their faith. Even though they had already experienced faith-building events through the plagues, through their journey out of the land of Egypt. This hopefully solidified their faith through the parting of the Red Sea, through once again the physical deliverance of the Israelites from the Egyptians. Okay, I'm really going to be done, okay? Just to close it up, a very familiar passage, Exodus chapter 14, for many of us, What struck me the most was that beginning part where God, where it begins, then the Lord said to Moses. The Lord told Moses that this was going to happen. He told him that the Egyptians were going to pursue. But he also told them, told Moses, that he was going to get the glory. Right? So again, what has the Lord told you? me. 
What has he said to us in the past? Are we listening? Are we hearing? Are we intentionally seeking to ask the Lord to speak to us? What are some things that we can hold on to when we go through? I'm at the Red Sea, and I don't know how the waters are going to part, and I've got people chasing after me. What is it that the Lord has said to you? And again, like Moses He doesn't know the specifics, but yet he knows God's promise. He knows that God says he will get the glory and that the Egyptians will know that the Lord is the Lord. He tells the people, fear not, right? He speaks with confidence because he knows God's character. Brothers and sisters, do you know the character of God? Do you know that God is for us and not against us? Do you know God's promises? Do you know him through experience? Do you know him because you have a deep and intimate relationship with him? And then again, God tells the people of Israel, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Why don't you start doing, start moving forward? Yes, you can pray, but you got to follow it up with action as well. What is it that God is asking you to move forward with, that you are not stagnant, that you just do it? What is it that the Lord is saying or inviting you to do, even as we close today? We're going to close with our closing song. But even as we do, I just want to invite you to come before the Lord, just really to ask him, Lord, what is it that, that, what is one thing that you want me to take away from this passage in Exodus 14? Is it fear not? Is it, I got to move forward? I got to put something into action? Is it remembering a promise that the Lord may have told you before, but somehow you have forgotten? Is it maybe asking the Lord to part the Red Sea for you, that you are facing a challenge, a difficulty, and you don't know how you're going to get through, but you need a desperate deliverance from Jesus so that he can make a way for you to move forward? Why don't we stand for those that are able to as we conclude um, with this closing song. So God, we come before you and we bow down before you, still before you, acknowledging, God, that you are our defender, you are our deliverer, you are our strong tower, and we don't have to fear. God, we thank you, Lord, for your promise that you spoke to Moses, that you speak to us today. We thank you for the words that you have already spoken to us. And we ask, God, that you would call to mind so that we can cling on to your promise, so that whatever circumstance we may be facing, whatever trial, whatever dead-end situation we may be in, that, God, we call out to you. We cling to you. We ask, God, that you would make a way, especially if we are up against a Red Sea situation, that you would part the waters for us, that you would lead us, that you would propel us forward, that you would help us to move forward, that you would give us the boldness and the courage to walk in faith. Father, if you ask us to raise up our staff and to stretch out our hands, that, God, we would just do that. We would obey you, that, Lord, we would choose to obey you whatever simple step of obedience that you call us to. God, we want to say yes to that. We want to say yes to whatever it is, Lord, whatever step of faith that we needed to be bold and take that step. But we want to walk out and step out in faith. Because, God, we know, Lord, that perfect love casts out all fear. And so we say that in the name of Jesus, fear be gone. God, we bring to you any fear that we may have, any fear that we may be holding on to, any fear that may be captivating us, Lord, that may be 
paralyzing us, Lord. We ask, God, that in the name of Jesus, you would break that fear right now. Fear of the future, fear of finances, fear of relational issues, Lord, whatever fear it is, God, you know. So, God, we ask for a mighty breakthrough today that you would shatter all fear, that there would be no fear in the name of Jesus, and that we would walk boldly when you tell us to move, that we would be marching forward, Lord, when it's through the Red Sea. Lord, even as you part the waters, even as around us the waters are raging to our side, Lord, that we would not lose sight of you, knowing, God, that your cloud is behind us, protecting us from our enemies. So, Jesus, we hold on to you right now, and we thank you for your promise that is true, that is secure, that propels us forward. Jesus, we thank you that you go before us, that you are our defender, that we are your people that we walk in freedom, that we don't have to walk in slavery anymore. So Jesus, we praise you, we thank you, and we say, Jesus, hallelujah for the freedom that you have given to each one of us. Help us, Lord, to walk as children of light, not as children of darkness, not as slaves anymore. Lord, that you have set us free, and because you have set us free, that we walk in freedom today. Thank you, Jesus. May we walk in freedom this week in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, whatever you are inviting us into, Lord. May we walk in freedom and be agents of your freedom. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.